Hi folks, um, welcome to your first video for unit four. And today we are going to start with our first branch of government and that is the judicial branch. So the focus of these next couple of units is going to be the interactions between um, the three branches of government. Um, so we're going to be looking at a lot of separation of powers and checks and balances throughout these next couple of units. So you have two objectives for this video. Um, the first one is to describe the structure of the federal court system and then explain how the nomination and confirmation process to the Supreme Court represents that principle of checks and balances. So let's start with um, the Articles of Confederation. Let's kind of go through the history of the Supreme Court and our federal court system. Under the Articles of Confederation, um, the federal court, as we know it, was non-existent, um, right? There was no federal system. Really, the only branch, uh, so to speak, was Congress. And it was, remember, very, very weak. Um, the reason being, uh, remember, our founding fathers originally were very wary of any kind of central leadership, very afraid of that very strong unitary government. Now, there were a few problems with this, and that's why, obviously, we don't have the articles anymore. Um, because we did not have a judicial branch, a federal judicial system, the judiciary was dependent on the states. Each state had their own judicial system. And because there was no national one, states could overturn and ignore national laws if they disagreed with them. Uh, and then also individual persons and states could not file grievances against the federal government, which does happen from time to time. So as you can see, there's really not a, uh, um, some, there's not a lot of consistency um, and there's not a way to address those grievances, right? And uh, as we saw under the articles back in Unit 1, um, states were definitely um, kind of ignoring national laws because they didn't need to. They were their own authority because they had the most power. Now, the federal court system in the United States is split into uh, first two parts. We have federal courts and then we have state courts. And each of these courts handles issues and grievances at their level. And yay, federalism, right? That's, that's part of why we have this. Um, now, I will say that most issues um, start in state courts. Most of the things that you are seeing on TV are in state courts. Um, but there are some things that, you know, that do take place in the federal court system. So, for example, um, uh, most disputes happen in the state courts. Uh, I mean, honestly, one of those examples is murder. Um, a lot of you guys might think that it's federal, but murder is a state, is usually, I should say, a state issue. Now, however, if murder happens uh, in a state and then... Uh, the body, like, you know, the murder victim is transported across state lines. That's when it becomes federal because it has crossed the borders of multiple states. Um, federal courts also um, handle issues like crimes against the United States, high dollar lawsuits involving citizens of different states. And as we will see, um, specifically with the Supreme Court, um, the constitutional questions and like technicalities of, of law, of what the constitution actually means. Now, the judicial system itself is, the federal, I should say, is outlined in Article 3 of the Constitution. That's what is going to establish the judicial branch. Now, oddly enough, um, we will take a look at all three articles, um, but Article 3 is really the shortest. The only court mentioned in Article 3 is the Supreme Court as the highest court. And then it does say that inferior courts may be established by Congress. So as we're looking at this federal system, um, when we're looking at district and appellate courts, those are established by Congress. Article 3 also outlines the life term for judges. Um, it doesn't explicitly say life term. It does say they may hold office during good behavior, and that has become or come to mean a life term. Now, this is really, really important. It allows justices to make unpopular yet necessary decisions, right? Because they don't have to worry about being elected. They don't have to worry about 
you know, uh, one branch removing them because their ideology is different from Congress or the president, so to speak. So they are insulated from political pressure. That's what that means, right? If they're serving for life, they can actually focus on the constitutional question and make those difficult uh, but necessary decisions that might be unpopular but are needed to uh, interpret the Constitution. And these life terms also provide for consistency in interpreting the law over time, um, right? If judges serve for life, that's usually 30, 40 years. That is consistency on the bench in it, how they interpret the Constitution. Article 3 also outlines the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court uh, and outlines different types of jurisdiction as well. So um, we have two types of jurisdiction. We have original jurisdiction, which is the authority to hear a case for the first time. This is your trial court. This is often, actually most of the time, this is what you're seeing on TV, right? This is what you think of when you think of a courtroom um, with witnesses, a jury, things like that. Then there is also appellate jurisdiction, which we'll get into as well. Um, this is the authority of a court to review, amend, and or overrule decisions made by lower courts. So there is no trial, as we will see in an appellate, um, in a court with appellate jurisdiction. They're just reviewing previous decisions um, and deciding to keep or overrule them. Article 3 also outlines the right to a jury trial, um, which, of course, is expanded in the Bill of Rights through various amendments that we'll see later in this course. But the founders thought that this was an important piece to include after their treatment um, uh, under British rule. OK, so this is our federal court system, uh, and we're going to look at um, the three types of courts that you see here. Now, I think it's uh, it, Kind of important to think of this like a pyramid because um, the further you go up the pyramid, right, the, the more authority they have and the fewer courts that there are. I think that's why it's important to think about it like this. So at the very bottom, you have district courts. There are the most, or this constitutes the most in our federal court system. Above the um, district courts, you have the U.S. Circuit Courts of Appeals. And then finally, at the very top, the highest authority is the U.S. Supreme Court. So we're going to break down what each of these do here in just a moment. District courts. So in our country, we have 94 district courts, and that is composed of nearly 700 total judges or justices. And these district courts have original jurisdiction. Um, that means, like I said before, they are kind of your trial courts. They hear the case originally. They hear the case for the first time. They determine the facts of the case. Um, so this is where you'll, you'll kind of see your guilt versus innocence, so to speak. That's where you have your original jurisdiction. And in these district courts, um, since this is a federal court, you're going to try federal crimes. Um, examples of federal crimes would be counterfeiting, uh, tax evasion at the federal level. And um, I know I did say that state handles most disputes like murder and violent crime, but some violent crime has been um, you know, kind of changed to be tried in these federal district courts. So some violent crime like drug trafficking, terrorism, acts of violence on federal property, right? There was an event um, a couple decades ago where there was a bombing in Oklahoma City at a federal building. Um, that individual was tried at a federal court, right? So you can see in Ohio, um, we have two district courts. We have a northern district and we have the southern district. Um, so we are as uh, Hamilton County down here in the su Southwest <laughs> division of the Southern District. Above the uh, district courts, we have the U.S. Circuit Courts of Appeal. And to appeal, I think it's important to know here, to appeal means to challenge a previous legal determination. Um, in this setup, we have 13 circuits, and I'll show you those when we're finished with this slide, with over 200 total judges. So you can see there are more courts, or sorry, excuse me, fewer courts um, as you go up that kind of federal system. 
And these circuit courts of appeals, um, because they're reviewing and challenging previous legal determination, have appellate jurisdiction. No cases start here. They're usually going to start in the uh, district courts or even the state courts. So what happens here is the losing party from a trial, let's say from a district court, let's say that they think that there was a violation of law, of procedure, and they think that that led to an incorrect verdict in a trial court. They can then appeal that decision to the circuit courts of appeal. There are no witnesses here. There are no jury. Or there is no jury. They are not declaring guilt or innocence. They're ruling on those procedural matters in which the lower courts or other parts of government may have erred or maybe have violated the Constitution. So a big example that I think here um, that might help you guys if you want to write down this example, right? Let's say that um, someone is on trial for murder in, in the district court or like they've committed an act of terrorism, let's say, because um, that's in the, the district courts. Let's say that they are convicted and declared guilty. However, they believe that there was a procedural issue, maybe with their attorney or maybe with how evidence was presented. So yes, they are guilty. However, they can appeal that conviction to the appellate courts, the Circuit Court of Appeals, right? And they could say, that, or as the, as the um, Court of Appeals is ruling, they could say that Yes, your attorney was incompetent. They did not present evidence the way that is properly uh, or supposed to be done. Um, so therefore, right, they can amend that person's sentence. Uh, depending on the crime, obviously, they could um, overrule that conviction. So like I said, they can either uphold or overturn that decision based on their review of those procedural matters. And then here is the United States, um, just kind of showing you the courts um, and the circuits. So we are in the Sixth Circuit here in Ohio. Um, and then I know that you only see 11 circuits. However, D.C. has two, one for D.C. itself and then one for federal crimes. And then at the very top of the system, we have the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court, we have nine total justices, and there is one chief justice and then eight associate justices. Um, these, um, or this, I should say, court has mostly appellate jurisdiction, but they can hear original cases. Um, and usually, you know, a lot of people, I think there's a misconception that like billionaires get tried in the Supreme Court and, you know, high profile crimes. That's not the case. Most of the time, the Supreme Court is simply doing that review where they overturn or uphold lower court decisions. But from time to time, they can hear original cases. And usually these um, cases that they are reviewing come from the circuit courts or from the state Supreme Courts. And once the Supreme Court rules, guys, that is the highest authority. Um, they're like at the very, very top. So the Supreme Court is going to vote whether or not to overturn the lower court's ruling. That is that appellate jurisdiction. The Supreme Court does decide what cases it hears, and we will go into this in a later um, set of notes. But usually these issues um, that they pick, the cases they pick, deal with major issues of the day. So, for example, right now, the Supreme Court is hearing things regarding the election. They're hearing things regarding abortion. They're hearing things regarding COVID, right, and whether or not rights were violated due to COVID. So those are some of the examples of major issues today. Now, one of the biggest things, actually the biggest thing that the Supreme Court does is it decides on technicalities of constitutional law. This act of reviewing and deciding if things are constitutional or not, interpretation of the Constitution is known as judicial review. And we will actually do a whole separate lesson on judicial review in class. Now, I think we're going to end this video here talking about a person's path to the Supreme Court. How does someone get to the Supreme Court or any of these federal, um, these federal courts? So Congress sets the number of justices that sit, quote unquote, on the bench. And that number has changed over time, um, as we just saw that it is currently nine. All federal judges, whether that's a district, 
circuit courts of appeals or the Supreme Court are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. This is also called the inv advice and consent of the Senate. And ultimately, this is an example of checks and balances, um, right? It has to be, you know, it has to go through two branches, it has to go through the executive and the Senate and part of Congress to make sure that the president isn't appointing someone that could potentially be, you know, against the will of, of the people, for instance. So the first step here is presidential nomination. Now, there is no official requirement to sit on the bench in the Constitution. There's nothing outlined like there is for a congressperson or the president. But there are a few common things that we see with presidential nominees. Um, usually they have experience as a judge or an attorney, right? They might be a district court judge or on the circuit court of appeals. Um, and usually they're older. Um, that trend is changing, but around 40 seems to be the more common trend today. Now, presidents are going to consider a few things when they're making their nominations. And this is honestly one of the most important things that a president can do uh, while they're in office because these justices serve for life. So they're going to consider the ideology of the justice. Now, justices are supposed to be impartial. Okay? They're not supposed to let their politics get in the way of their decisions. But, right, they're people, right, just as we saw with factions, you can't get rid of people's opinions. They're, you know, they're going to have some political leaning. And those political leanings impact their judicial philosophies. So the president is going to consider, uh, you know, their ideology, how they lean. Um, there is something called a litmus test that uh, the Senate will ask to kind of gauge how uh, ideological the candidate is, the nominee is. And um, one of the things that this litmus test does is to determine that political ideology, yes, but also to think, is that judge too conservative or too liberal? Because if they come across as too conservative or too liberal, the president knows that that person is not going to be confirmed by the Senate. Um, now, one thing to note as well is generally the same, or the nominee, I should say, has the same political beliefs as the appointing president. So the president is going to nominate someone that is ideologically similar to them. And as the ideology of the court changes, so do their decisions. So like I said, it's important for a president to be able to nominate someone and have them put onto the court. Presidents will also consider the age of the nominee as well. Um, typically, presidents want their appointees to serve for a solid length of time. Justices are currently being appointed at younger ages and are now serving longer um, than they used to. And like I've mentioned many times already, appointments are that long lasting change that they can make during uh, their administration, right? It's kind of like their legacy, so to speak. Um, for instance, Trump has had three Trump has been able to nominate three justices, which is a third of the court, um, which has a, a long impact because they're cons relatively conservative judges um, onto the Supreme Court. And they're going to be making those typically conservative decisions for many, many years to come. Now, the second step in this process is the Senate confirmation. So once the president makes their nomination, the Senate will hold a hearing often, um, and that is done by the Judiciary Committee. We'll talk about committees when we talk about Congress, but they're going to essentially review that nomination. They're going to ask them those questions to identify their political leaning, and then they will vote. A simple majority in the Senate is needed for confirmation. So uh, 51 is what is needed. And this can be very easy or it can be very difficult, right? So think about right now um, in our divided government. Uh, well, not so much right now, I guess, because the president is Republican and the Senate is majority Republican. But imagine if the president were Republican and the Senate were Democratic, right? That could be very difficult to get a nominee passed because the majority of the people voting on your nominee are a different ideology from you. So it might be very difficult to have someone pass. Um, now, as the case with um, President Trump, these last two nominations, um, it was relatively easy because he is Republican and the nominees that he has given um, are Republican as well. So that was fairly easy. 
Final thing we're going to talk about here, folks, is something called senatorial courtesy. And this is um, kind of beyond the Senate confirmation. This is kind of a separate thing that happens. And usually it's routine with lower court appointments, especially those district courts. So this is different from that Senate confirmation to the Supreme Court. But senatorial courtesy is a custom where if there's a vacancy on a lower court, not the Supreme Court, but a lower court, um, a state senators, wherever that court is, would recommend a judge to the White House to be appointed, right? It's kind of like a courtesy, a custom um, to kind of go through the Senate first to see who they would like to have in the district or circuit courts of appeal. Um, and the president will then kind of take that into mind um, as they're making those lower court appointments. All right, guys, so your goals for today were to describe the structure of the federal court system and explain how the nomination and confirmation process to the Supreme Court represents the principle of checks and balances. So go back, fill in anything if you need to, and answer these questions. Let me know if you have any in class, and I will talk to you soon. See ya.